Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. We are live on YouTube. I'm here with Sarah. Hi. And we are back after a week hiatus or two, two week, weeks. Two week hiatus. <laughs> so last week I was on Monhegan Island, which is an artist colony actually off the coast of Maine. And um, I was painting with a wonderful group of women from Louisiana. And on top of the island, it's kind of weird. It's kind of in the middle. It's like right up at the peak. There is this beautiful lighthouse. And I shared this photo on Instagram. A lot of people were really uh, interested interested in it and this is a sketch that I did on location but I thought that I would um, use the the photo from Instagram that I took because I like that composition better it's the lighthouse will make the lighthouse bigger and more simplified and it will give us a little more room to kind of get in there and paint but uh, this was really fun to sketch on location I find that when I sketch on location it's not uh, I get a really good sense of my environment but my painting usually is not the most skilled it's when I get home and I can um, have my normal supplies around that I find that I do a better painting but it's really worthwhile to paint on location just because of the um, observation skills it gives you. Uh, Sarah will be moderating the chat today so if you have any questions for me you can uh, type the word question in all caps and she will relay it to me. Um, the pattern is available on my website if you click in the video description to go over to my website in the supply list it says printable pattern click on the words printable pattern and it will take you to the printable pattern it, you'll be able to print it right from that screen um, it's just the easiest way I think to, to put the pattern out there so um, that's where that is if you can't find it I, a lot of people don't know where to click they expect it to be a picture on the site but you actually have to click over to get the PDF um, this video is brought to you by jerrysartorama.com. I have a link to all the supplies I used and the value pack of the Mimic brushes are 50% are off today. So if you've been waiting to get that value pack that's um, the Jerry's price is usually 50 bucks. It's on sale for $24.99. So it's a great time to grab that. And I'm using Sennelier watercolors and all the colors I'm using with the exception of olive green are from the um, 12 plus six free half pan set that they have on sale. So I thought it'd be nice to kind of uh, use something that is a really high quality, but fairly affordable. Did I forget anything? Uh, watercolor questions only. Uh, yes, please. Please type the word question in all caps. If we have a lot of questions or Lindsay's talking, it may take me a few minutes to get to your questions. Also, mm -hmm. if the moderators, we have some fabulous moderators. We have Joe, we have Grace, we have Eve and some other people, they may be able to answer your question as well. Great, yes, and if it's a question we get a bazillion times, the moderators will probably jump right in and answer it. Um, so that just keeps, it keeps it from getting too repetitive for the folks that watch every week. So and I hope you do watch every week because because uh, it's a lot of fun to bring these to you. All right, we're gonna start off by wetting the sky area. And uh, you can use whatever brush you find comfortable. If you prefer to use a flat, use a flat. If you like to use a big juicy round, use a round. It really doesn't matter. I find sometimes if I have a painting where um, where there's a lot of straight edges, I find it's a little easier to use a flat. Um, all the brushes that I'm going to use today are from that value pack that I mentioned. I really think um, that's a great place to start if you need watercolor brushes or if you want some really absorbent ones. The only thing I caution is that if you're a beginner, um, you may find that you get way too much water with these brushes until you learn how to kind of control the amount of water you need. I'm going all the way down to the land. I'm going over the tree area here too. Uh, and also for mixing colors, if you find that you cannot get you know, vivid mixes, use a golden Taclon brush. And those can be found very inexpensively. That's like this one right here. They have the golden um, synthetic bristles. These are synthetic too, but they're designed to mimic real fur. So they're very absorbent. So you wanna look for something with like a white or gold bristle. Those are gonna be stiffer and you won't get so much water when you're mixing. So kind of keep that in mind if you're having an issue with your paints being too light. Going right along the roof line here, the flat edge of the brush can kind of help you get that crisp edge. And the paint's only going to go where the water is, so you go right up over the railing, right up to the edge of the lighthouse there. Now there are some areas within the white the lighthouse where you would get some sky color. Um, so I will be wetting those, but I think I'll do those with a smaller brush just so I don't um, overreach it. And you can tell if your paper's wet, if you kind of tip it and it's all glossy and there aren't puddles, you kind of want to even sheen to it. 
sometimes you have to re-wet it after the initial wetting. So a lot of times I will wet the paper, go mix my paint, and then wet it again. Okay, and then inside the lighthouse, I'm just going to go in with a smaller brush around because I can um, control that a little bit better. And I'm just going to go wet right across because I can put those darker columns in later if I want to. I might not even want to put them in there. It'll depend. I'm going to go around the little lights, though, that are in the center. But I am going to fill in the uh, what would be that dark panel in case I want to leave that out. I had it in on the... Um, on the sketch that I did, because that what that's what was really there. But then I was thinking, you know, I think it would be cool if I could kind of see the sky all the way through. And then I get, give a little tip and make sure that you've got it all wet. So the sky color, we are going to use some uh, ultramarine blue and a blue that's called Sinners Blue, which is, I think, a Sennelier exclusive color because I haven't seen it before. Doesn't really matter what brand you use, um, and you can use a cerulean blue if you don't have the cinnamon blue. It's just a little bit more of like a a greener blue. So this is my ultramarine, tried and true. Actually, this might be a Da Vinci color because I I had to refill that uh, that pan while I was out. And then uh, the cinnamon blue is a mix. You could use cerulean. That's not going to hurt anything. Okay, and then for applying the paint, you can use whatever you whatever you want. I'm going to go back to the flat because um, I think that'll be nice for a sky. I'm going to just pick up a little bit of the cinnamon blue and then a lot of the ultramarine blue, and I'm going to add the color up at the top and just kind of wisp it down because it's kind of a wispy sky type of day. Don't worry if you get a little in the hood. Uh, just you know, try to be careful, but don't like worry too much. Uh, Baru Siva, would using white watercolor or gel pen affect light fastness of the painting? Will the white fade? No, no, it should be fine. The gel pen, I haven't had any issues with the gel pen. I suppose, you know, some pens could yellow, but I haven't had that issue with the Unibal Signo. That's what I typically use. Um, but it's, I think the gel ink, I think it might have a little bit of an oil in it. If you're going to add more, like, darker color, Add it up at the top first and then work your way down because your sky is darker the higher it is. But I want these wispy clouds, so I am kind of putting it in a linear type of fashion. And then I just generally use some up as I'm going so it gets lighter as I go. You can add a little bit of water to it if you need to. Get the, the oceany windswept sky here. And if you ended up putting your paint in and it flowed everywhere and you didn't get that um, that windswept look, if you're using a good quality paper, like arches, you can take your paper towel and just wisp it across, and that will lift up those uh, clouds for you. So I, I try not to do that with a, with a uh, paper, like a wood pulp paper, just because it's not as durable. And now we're going to go down to the ground area, and we're going to wet that as well whatever brush you like. Just go right up to the buildings, but not over them. And this is a little bit of a boat there. You can see in my sketch here, I've got that, that boat right there. And we just see a little piece of it in the photo, so that's what I put in there. This is, there's an art gallery at the top of the uh, mountain there. It's uh, I didn't get a chance to go in it. It was closed when we were there, but... It's kind of cool. All right, so now we're going to use, um, I'm going to go right in with some lemon yellow to give me some nice bright kind of fresh uh, grass color. It's going to mix in with our greens, but I just want to kind of get that in there right off the bat. I like to let the paint mix on my paper sometimes. And then I'm going to grab my olive green, and you can use sap green. A lot of olive greens are kind of dull, but I find the Sennelier olive green to just be so fresh and lively. And I also wanted to mention, they have a student line that's really good. So if you're kind of on the fence or you're buying it for um, for a child, uh, don't hesitate to get the student line. I think performance-wise, it performs as well as the um, as a professional line. And I got the, the student set of 24, and it had this beautiful olive green in it. And so I went and bought a tube of the artist's grade because I like the student grade so much. 
I didn't have any, I have no qualms recommending that paint at all. Okay, and then I want to darken some of the bushes here, so I'm going to grab some ultramarine blue. Uh, Lainey Davila, if you use a little gouache in a watercolor painting, can it still be considered watercolor? Um, you know, it, it really depends. I, I, you could call it watercolor if you're using it pretty um, transparently, but if you were like competing in like a jurid show for, you know, watercolor, um, it may not be considered watercolor. So you just, I mean, do what you want to do, but if you're, if you are like considering um, entering in a competition, you just want to make sure that you're, for, you're following their, um, their rules. But some watercolor pigments are naturally more opaque, such as your iron oxide pigments. Um, I, I, you know, I just say what, you know, what's, what's your goal for your painting? Like sometimes I will, I used to be really like against adding white to my watercolor. Um, but sometimes you end up with a painting and it's going to go in the trash. And I think it's a much better idea to actually grab out that gel pen, grab out that, um, that white paint, grab out the gouache or whatever you want to use and fix it. You know, make it make it something usable. So I'm adding a little burnt sienna in here too, because you have always have these little bare patches of ground. Uh, Ashton Mack. Lindsay uses the term fresh a lot. What exactly makes a color fresh? Usually like single pigments or um, transparent uh not muddy like it doesn't it's not an earthy tone it's um it's got a more of a luminous it's luminescence to it by being, being like transparent and just being bright and clean looking basically kind of if you think of like a lemon yellow is a nice fresh bright well let me show you my palette here i'm pointing at it but you can't see it because it's off camera like that's a nice bright fresh color versus like a naples yellow or a yellow ochre which are much more muddy looking because of the pigments that they use but it could also be like a single pigment color that has a lot more vibrancy to it. Okay, so at this point, I am going to hit this with a heat gun. So if you have any questions while I'm drying, it would be a great time to ask them. And uh, then we'll move on to the bricks of the lighthouse. I taped down my painting on all four sides this time because I knew I was going to do a lot of wet washes and I didn't want my paper to uh, buckle while I was trying to paint on it. When I was painting this, I forgot of all things and I packed them. I forgot to bring uh, bulldog clips with me. So my painting kept like flapping in the breeze. It was oh, very no. irritating and I had a whole baggie of them. I had like, I had even bought extra packages of binder clips for this class and I left them back at the cottage. Uh, Lexi B116. I bought a leather journal on sale that was crafted with handmade handmade paper, and I want to see if the paper could take watercolor without damaging. Uh, the only way to know is by trying it. You might want to put a like a little sheet of cardboard or something between the pages and try one sheet. That way, if it doesn't work out that well, you haven't damaged any other pages. After you heat your paper, um, after you dry it, you may need to repress down your tape because heat does loosen adhesive. So if you've ever taped something down and you can't, the tape won't peel up, you can always try heating it with a hairdryer or a heat tool to remove it. Don't use this with masking fluid, though, because you will end up baking it into your paper. There's some fun projects coming up next week. I, I will be away, but I do have videos posting. I have a vacation mini album book and keepsake box posting on Sunday and a couple card making tutorials next week. So lots of fun things. If you are um, if you are looking at for creative projects and good news, I just found out my um, my craftsy class is now available on DVD and the DVD is on sale this weekend. Yay. So yeah, there's a link in the video description. I'm so excited because they only chose a few um, a few classes for the DVD pilot program, and mine was one of them. And generally, the D normally the DVD is going to cost forty five dollars, but it's on sale for twenty bucks, so nineteen ninety nine. So uh, if you were if you have been waiting to try a class, but you really wanted it on DVD, now's your chance. Uh, Alexandra Manga, what different kinds of tape would work to tape down the paper? Um, painter's tape, like the blue 
or, or green painters tape are great but honestly if you have a dollar tree um i like the dollar tree masking tape because it's not that sticky so probably not great for like holding things but as far as like holding your water paper down watercolor paper down it's ideal so that's what i use until they change the recipe or change the you know wherever they buy it from that's working good for me so for our stone color we are going to start off with some ultramarine blue and you got to mix some burnt sienna into that. You could use burnt umber if you don't have burnt sienna. Sometimes um, there's, like if you use Mission Gold paints, the Mission Gold burnt sienna uses a funny mix. And it actually will turn green when you mix it with um, uh, with ultramarine for some reason. It must have, I think it has like um, a quinacridone gold in it or something like that. It turns green. So if you are having that issue, it could be, it's probably not you. It's the paint. Uh, so just wanted to let you know that. I also am going to grab some of this Naples yellow. You could also use yellow ochre. I'm going to throw that over there and add a little bit of that uh, gray into it. So I have a nice uh, kind of highlight color. Add a little more burnt sienna to it. So I have these kind of like muddy muted colors. So these would not be fresh colors. These are colors that I intentionally want to be kind of dark and uh, muddy because I'm trying to paint really dull looking stone that kind of has some like rust on it. Uh, Celine C, what masking fluid brands do you recommend for your paintings? And will masking fluid affect a piece's archival qualities? No, because you remove the masking fluid. Um, I use removable removable masking fluid. There is um, permanent masking fluid, but then you can't change, you can't paint anything on that paper afterwards. So um, I recommend uh, any brand of colored removable masking fluid. That way you can see it. I've only used Windsor & Newton brand. I've also used Grumbacher um, Niskit, but I found it didn't last very long. Like it, it got chunky in the jar, whereas the, um, the Windsor & Newton does last for a long time. I've had one bottle for like 15 years, and I still, oh, I'm still able to use from it. So, you know, because of that, I recommend the Windsor Newton. However, I've heard a lot of really good things about PBO drawing gum. And the nice thing about that is it goes on, I think, like a light blue, but it dries black. So you can really see where you've put it. And sometimes uh, even the colored Windsor Newton masking fluid is just a pale yellow. It's really hard to see um, where you've put it sometimes. Uh, truth be told, I don't use it that much because I don't. I'm impatient and I don't like waiting for it to dry and I don't find that brings me joy in my painting and I like to I like to enjoy my painting so uh, I only use it very sparingly and not very often um, and there's also pens that have the masking fluid in it but I've never used them so if anybody in chat wants to give their recommendation recommendations please do I've never used enough of it that I've you know gone out and tried a bunch because I didn't want to go to waste it's not cheap so um, so probably ask some other friends in chat uh, Lainey Davila, I recently noticed that Turner says both burnt sienna and burnt umber are PBR7. They don't list another pigment mixed in, so how can the same pigment create two different colors? It depends on how they mill it. The finer they grind it, it's going to change the color. Um, so that's that's it. I, I wondered that myself, but it's just however they, they mill it. It will give you distinctly different colors. Just like PV19 creates a whole range of reds, pinks, and purples. It's, uh, it's, how, they, it's how they mill it. How finely they grind it. So I'm taking my darkest color. So it's the ultramarine blue and the burnt sienna, but probably a little more blue. And I'm adding that um, in the shadowier areas. I'm going to add that along the left hand side here. I do want to, I think, lift a little out up here on the ridge, though. I should have. That's all right. I'm just going to lift it out. That's not going to be an issue. We can always scrub it out if it gets, if it bleeds up there too much. Then I'm going to go with a little bit of this um, mix with the yellow ochre that's a little bit lighter or Naples yellow, whichever you're using, and kind of fill in a little bit. Our paper's wet, so it's diluting our paint and it is going to dry a little bit lighter. So, um, so keep that in mind. You want a, a smidgen darker than what you want to end up with. And we will be adding some dry brushing for texture and, um, and glazing later. I'm adding, I just put a little bit more yellow in that mix for the side that's going to be um, kind of on the right, which is catching a little more sun. There was this weird lichen on everything out on uh, Monhegan Island, and it was kind of like a goldish-orange color. 
and I'm not exactly sure um, what that was, but usually you see like the green like in in other places, and I thought that was interesting. I painted it on my uh, on my sketch and kind of immediately regretted it because it looked kind of horrible. But that's what your on location sketches are for, for capturing information. Um, and then when you go back to your studio, you can uh, choose to omit or keep whatever you want in your final paintings. I'm going to go a little darker here. I felt like it kind of washed out quite a bit, so I'm just adding a little bit more color while it's still wet. And this is uh, number eight round. I also think I'll put some of that kind of rusty color in there, just using the burnt sienna kind of on its own. Do it now so it doesn't kind of stay very uh, strong and this is rust from the ladder that we'll paint in I like the way that looks actually and that light color I'm gonna do that light color up here on the rim and if I have to lift out a little bit later I shouldn't have to paint any more back on I should be able to just lift and, and let it be and then I'm going to go back over to this gray here and paint the inside of the uh, lid of our lighthouse. I'm going to go around the light. Uh, Tessa Reed, I want to replace my Cotman permanent rose with a Daniel Smith equivalent. I'm not sure if the Daniel Smith color color equivalent is quadacridone rose or quadacridone pink is there a website that translates colors across brands um hand print might do a good job but you might end up getting a little overwhelmed with the amount of information um but i will tell you that i really like quinacridone uh quinacridone rose it is um in the essential the six color essential set from daniel smith and it's a fantastic color i use it a lot so i would really recommend going with that color if you don't have an equivalent to that because uh, it's just a really pure, cool red that, that mixes really well. Um, so now I'm going to come down here, and I want to tone the white buildings. So I'm just going to add water to my gray mix. And I'm going to add a little bit of that uh, other blue that we used in the sky, that cinnarus blue, to make kind of like a, um, like a really, really pale, cool gray. And I'm just going to go right in like a really wet brush really watery paint I'm just gonna go right in and paint though paint that it's such a small area I don't really need to wet it first go right down to the boat and I did leave a little sparkle, like I, I left a few little uh, like hints of white just to kind of um, keep the look fresh. And if you have any puddles, you will want to dry your brush off and just soak them up so you don't get blooms. But um, mine spread out pretty well, so I don't need to do that. Uh, the next color we're going to mix up is kind of like a rusty red. And I'm just going to clean up a little spot in my palette. And I'm going to use bright red. You can use um, scarlet or um, pyrrole scarlet or cad red or whatever you have for a warm red. I'm going to add some burnt sienna to that. Keep reusing the same colors. And I think I'm going to add a little bit of um, ultramarine to kind of tone it down a little bit. So this is the color we're going for, this kind of um, brick red color. And I am going to paint the roofs here, but I want to leave a little uh, slice of bright white between the roof and the body of the, of the building so we don't bleed and also it will give us a nice highlight.
<clears throat> and then um, this color will also go on that building, but I need to let other things dry first. So I think I'm going to go up here and get the uh, top of the lighthouse painted. Just go really gently with this because it's really easy for this to get too big. It got too big on my sketch. Um, so I'm just going to just go in with the tip of my brush and work from the inside out so that I can uh, hopefully keep it under control. Boy, everybody seems quiet in chat today. Are they all just chatting amongst themselves? They or? are, yeah. Yep. I did. Uh, Amanda Dalton, would the Karen Dosh student grade watercolor pencils be better or as good as a professional such as Derwent? Uh, let's see. Is there student grade super color? I've used some super colors and they're as good as Derwent. I'm not sure if that's there. I know they have museum, which is like um, really high quality. I'm not sure about the about the um if if they're not the super colors i'm not sure i'm also going to take that color and go on the bottom of this boat because there even though you can't see it in the photo i know there's a stripe there because i painted it in my um in my sketch okay <clears throat> now i'm going to grab some burnt sienna on its own kind of uh, tap it off on my palette. I'm going to grab a little of that uh, Cinerous Blue just to tone down the red in there in that color, the orange in that color, and I'm going to paint the inside of the boat here. Uh, Michael Ann, have you used the neutral gray? What is a good use for it? It came in the core set and I ha and hasn't been touched but to swatch it. <laughs> Uh, I have I don't really use gray, um, but something that would be handy for is to like do an all gray study, do a, do a monochrome. I think it's one of those, if you're going to use it, I would use it and I would add it to mix it in with most of the colors as you're doing a painting so it doesn't look out of place. Okay, I want to dry this before I go into this building because I think the lighthouse is still a little wet. So if you have any other questions, now would be a really good time to ask them. Uh, Beverly Bryce, the lines showing on the stones on the lighthouse are they your drawing lines? Yes, they are. They're from the um, they're from the sketch. They will be in the pattern as well because I just scanned my um, my sketch before I started painting on it for your pattern. Uh, Mayor Magoo, I have trouble determining the temperature of my colors. Some are obvious, but quite a few are not. Any tips or techniques for determining color temperature? Um, yeah, I would swatch them next to, if you have like a red that you know is warm, swatch it down. And if you have another red you're not sure, swatch it down next to it. And then you can tell if it's cooler or warmer. Or you can try mixing. Like if you're trying to find a cool red, you can try mixing a violet. If it doesn't make a violet, then it's not a, uh, it's not a cool red. Okay, so now I am going to uh, do the roof here. I'm actually going to grab some of that sky blue color and mix it into my gray that I have going. So it'll be a little bit different than the gray from the stones. So it's still going to be, I almost ran out of that color there. It's still going to be the burnt sienna and ultramarine blue, but just a little bit of that other blue added in. Uh, Alexandra Manga, have you tried the water-soluble graphite pencils? Yes, I have. Um, they are, they're fun for sketching because then you get to kind of sketch and paint at one time. I don't use them a heck of a lot, but they're kind of cool. I like them. And I don't seem to notice much difference between brands. They all seem to be very, uh, similar. I'm leaving the, uh, kind of soffit area unpainted. Just get in the shingle area here. You can actually scrape uh, the shingles on with a credit card scraper. Let's see if I have one here. I'm all out of sorts. I've been here, there, and everywhere. There we go. I'm so glad the microphone issue, knock on wood, seems to have worked out. Nobody's saying anything, and I'm assuming if the microphones weren't working, people will let us know. I think so. 
There we go. Painting shingles can be kind of a drag, so do the credit card scraper is a little bit easier. <laughs> uh, Adriana H Henniger, what watercolor palette would you suggest for students? Um, I really like the, uh, what I usually teach with is the Cotman um, Sketcher Box of 12, but the Lucas Sketcher Box of 12 is also good. And also the Aquafine uh, Half Pan Box is good. Um, the Sennelier one is good too. Uh, it's a little more expensive than those other brands though. So it depends if you have to outfit a whole class, it will probably be a little cost prohibitive. But the Cotman one is good. It's tried and true and you can refill from tubes. But Cotman, Lucas, um, those will all be under 20 bucks. I'm just using that same color from the roof with just a little bit of water added to um, paint the bricks on this building. As I get up to the eve, I'm going to add some ultramarine blue to that color because I want to, um, it's in shadow and I want to just darken it right now and get that done in one go. Uh, Echo Falcon, what are your views on the line and wash watercolor style of painting? Um, I like it. I think it's a great way to quickly capture um, uh, an image. I really like it for on the on the go sketching because you can, you know, your lines, you can sketch with a pen and get everything in there fairly accurately and then just throw some color in as opposed to just doing it with the watercolor, which can take a little bit longer. I'm going to go right underneath the eave with that same dark color while I'm at it. Hopefully I don't get a bloom. Linda McAllister, I can't get the blue paint stains out of my watercolor tin. Any solution for that? You can try a magic eraser. That usually works pretty well. Um, as long as you can see what you're mixing, it shouldn't be a big deal. It's those thalo cyan colors and quinacridone colors that uh, stain. If it's a blue, it's the thalo cyans that are probably staining on you. But I wouldn't, I mean, if it doesn't bother you, if you can still see your mix, I really wouldn't worry about it. I don't stress about it. I'm taking some of that, uh, that gray that I used from the roof. It's still on my palette, and I'm going to go in, and I'm going to put a little shadow underneath my eave here. And then I'm also going to use this for um, dragging just some, like, siding lines across. Uh, Bauru Siva, have you done coffee painting and do you like it? Um, I really haven't. Coffee is good for drinking. It's also <laughs> acidic, so I wouldn't want to spend a lot of time on something that I know is going to deteriorate. deteriorate. I don't buy cheap coffee, so I'm going to drink my coffee. <laughs> I know. I buy good coffee, too. I just went to Sam's Club the other day. I like to get my, they have, I don't think they sell bad coffee there. Well, I mean, they sell like all the regular, they sell the regular brands, mm -hmm. but their own brand is really excellent. Is it? I've yes, tried it. It's really good. The Members Mark, or they have another one that's like Free Trade, uh, not Free Trade, Um, Fair Trade. Yeah. It's a hazelnut. It's a Zalvita oh, or something. Oh, hazelnut. You do like hazelnut or you don't like hazelnut? Um, You're not a big flavored coffee, are yeah, you? Yeah, no, I really, I usually just do, because I drink my coffee black, mm -hmm. so... The stuff that they use to make it flavored, to me, it makes the coffee taste weird because I'm not mixing it with, like, cream or sugar or right. enough or anything. So it just tastes, like, weird to me. Yeah, I, I like that. Actually, I like it black or, like, if if, uh, if my husband makes coffee, he usually makes it a little weaker than I do, so I'll drink it black if he makes it. And uh, I think it tastes good. I But coffee out places, like Dunkin' Donuts, I've noticed, I think they use, like, a syrup, and I don't like that. I don't like that fake... Uh, yeah, no, that stuff is... Ugh. I don't like that stuff, but... All right, so now I'm going to mix up uh, some more shadow here. I'm going to do ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. How do you make gray as a color? I get asked a lot. <laughs> I get asked you a lot. You mix black and white! <laughs> as I see her visibly cringe. <laughs> Yeah, the ladies I was painting with last week were joking about the, because uh, every other question was, uh, how do you mix gray? <laughs> I 
I think everyone knows how to mix gray in that group now. <laughs> so I'm going to take this darker color and put it under the uh, lip of the rail here, the little ledge on the top of our lighthouse. I got a good question on YouTube the other day, and I I did answer the person that asked, but I thought this is probably a good one to share. Uh, somebody had asked, when they're painting, uh, like in plain air, they're, they're looking at a scene or maybe even painting from a photograph, and there's all kinds of there's stuff in there they can't really see, especially when you're working for a photograph and you can't really see what's going on. Like it might be a blob, it might be a tree, you're really not sure. What do you do? Um, and my advice would be to just leave it out. Or you could be really vague about it, but if you're not sure what it is, it can be really inauthentic looking to kind of fake it. So just leave it out. Carry on the scene as if it wasn't even there. And now I'm just going to drag some of that shadow across, especially in the little uh, gaps between the bricks. And I don't have uh, the papers dry. I could just kind of drag my brush across on its side and get that texture. And that really makes it look stony and three-dimensional when you do this. But the key is not a lot of paint. Just put the paint kind of in the shadow area and drag it out. And your brush does need to be a certain size to do this. You don't want to fiddle around with a tiny brush to do this. You you have to have something with a little bit of um, of a heft to it. Now I can do that on this side too. I'm going to add a little of my Naples yellow in there and um, add a little water to it because I don't want a little bit of... Uh, burnt sienna too. I don't want to have a dark color, so I'm going to start with a diluted color. But you have to be careful because when you dilute the color, you add water, so then your brush is sopping wet. So you need to dry your brush off before you go dip back into that color because the extra water is going to um, void out your dry brushing. But again, a great way to go about it is to add the color on the edge. Now it's not going to be shadowed over here, but it is going to be a little darker than the center, and then just drag it out. And it's going to catch that texture and really give you that nice stony look. And you can, uh, I really like the pencil lines on this uh, because it kind of does a lot of the work for you as far as the, uh, the patterning. So you don't have to put everything in. And, and I wouldn't because if you do, it starts to look really fake. can add a little bit of that kind of rusty very lightly because this is quite a bit different in color so you don't want to overdo it it's not really going to make sense why there's rust there until you paint the um, the metal drop down like stairs fire escape or whatever that is I guess it's to get up to the top of the lighthouse from I guess you probably would come out this little door and go up to the top of the lighthouse to do your lighthouse keeping duties. That would be so cool to like live in an old light lighthouse. Mm. Probably hard to heat. Hard to heat and yeah, I don't know. You'd have to be okay with being pretty isolated. Yeah, that, that's see that's the thing I don't think I would, it's like on Monhegan Island there's only 40 to 60 full-time residents. So it's like, can you imagine out in the middle of the winter, you know, one of these main winters and, you know, it's storming and you only got like... You know, the only way to get to civilization is by boat. Yeah. So if you have to be willing to cross the ocean in a boat. Yeah. You definitely need to like have emergency rations and stuff. Yeah. Uh, Tiffany Gray, is there any benefit to using one big bucket of water versus one cleanup cup, one rinse cup combo? Uh, is there an advantage to using a big bucket versus a two? No, yeah. it's it's wasteful, and you're not going to get because look at this. I just this is what I'm using today. I've got a, just one divided water bucket, and you'll notice, especially if you're painting on plain air, you, if you you just have two little cups or something, you can't carry big water buckets. Um, as long as I keep cleaning my brush in that and I dip this from this side for fresh water, my water, and keep in mind my water bucket's very old and, you know, stained and everything, but um, you can get so much painting done in this method because you waste so little. Uh, the big bucket, your whole bucket's going to get dirty and, you know, you'll have to carry a big bucket around. I, I think it's definitely the way to go to get 
you know, even two small cups is better than one big bucket. Okay, so now I'm going to take that same dark. If you need to make some more, go ahead. Ultramarine blue, burnt sienna. Finally getting through all the... I still have sand in this palette from the Bahamas. And I'm trying to, like, work through those layers with the, with the sand in them. I spilled a drink on my palette the other day. It was my brand new Rembrandt, Rembrandt pants, too. And I was wearing a... Uh, wearing a poncho and I reached over and the poncho kicked over my glass <laughs> oh, and uh, no. yeah my palette smells like vino hopefully I <laughs> clean I rinsed it but I don't know <laughs> it'll be all right that'll just be your home one instead of your public one right <laughs> well it's brand new I think I cleaned it up pretty well but I think I'm gonna take it with me um, on vacation so I use it and get like hopefully that top layer of potentially alcohol leaving paint off <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a little fragrant <laughs> it's okay it's, there could be there could be worse smells than a little bit of vino yeah well there are the whiskey painters and they paint with a flask of whiskey instead of water And well, like if I have dark paint on my brush, I'll look around, see anywhere else I can use it before I rinse it off. It just saves time and it saves paint. So it's a win-win. I think I'll also take this color to do the railing. Now the railing is actually pretty light here, but um, but I think it kind of I think it would look nice a little darker. So that's what I'm going to do. And just I'm still using that number eight round. I mean, it's very when you get a good round brush that comes to a nice point, um, it's very versatile and you can do a lot with it. And I think I actually when I, if I do the the railing and these kind of um, lines between each pane of glass with this darker color, I don't think I'll need the darker area in here, and I think it will actually look a little nicer to see kind of the sky through like that. I think there's mirrors in the lighthouses anyway, so it would be perfectly, um, you know, acceptable for it to be sky color because it could be reflecting the sky. Uh, ZZ Ninky. My Lucas pans are melting because of the hot weather, and they are so messy whenever I bring them along on my trip. How can I keep them dry? Ah, yeah, it's probably the humidity more than the heat that's bothering those. Um, I don't know. You could try a couple silica packets um, in the paint, but I honestly think, like, kind of keeping the palette open as much as possible when you're working or when you're not using it, uh, like if it's in your hotel room or... Um, Anytime it's not in your bag and being transported, I would try to keep the uh, I would try to keep the palette open. Uh, Lainey Davila about the poncho Lindsay wore. How can she wear good clothes when painting? I get paint everywhere on me. Well, it's watercolor, so it would wash off. Um, and I was painting downstairs, so she it's says just chilly. She's wearing white pants. Yeah. I'm a, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, she is brave. I never wear white pants because I can't even wear a white t-shirt without spilling something all over me. Well, this is why I usually don't, but I, uh, I, I kind of like the look of white pants and I actually had a couple in my drawer. It's like, why am I keeping these if I don't You're wear right. them? So I actually packed some to wear on Monhegan and I didn't spill paint on myself. I tripped stepping out of the Monhegan, the little Monhegan church they had. Um, I stepped, <laughs> tripped fell on one of my students cup of coffee and I had coffee down my leg the entire time I was so embarrassed because these fine southern ladies that I'm teaching see me being a dingbat and falling on their, their cup of coffee that they were too polite to bring it to a church <laughs> sitting oh my gosh <sighs> I think and there were a different pair of pants I think I did get the coffee stain mostly out but uh yeah. Yeah. I, I like the look of white pants. I just know what a disaster I am with around white. Just yeah. a white t shirt. So I'm like, white pants would be. Well, I figured if they're staying in my wardrobe, because I'm all being like minimalist and stuff, if yeah. they're staying in my wardrobe, I'm going to wear them. Yeah. I look at them in the stores and I put them back on the rack and I don't buy them. Well, it's funny because these were actually like uh, um, hand me downs for the for the girls. Uh, mm -hmm. There's they. Uh, one of our friends is a teenager, and uh, and they were actually too big for the girls. And so I'm like, oh, look at these fit me. And into my drawer they went, and they just sat there for years. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to wear them. Uh, Tessa Reed, do you think the Mission Gold 32 set is worth the money at $62? Are they artist or student grade? And would you compare the quality to Daniel Smith? 
They are artist grade. Um, Mission Gold are extremely vibrant. I have this set of 24 Pure Pigment, and that's really what I recommend, just because you can mix all the other colors that they offer from those uh, from the Pure Pigment set. I'm pretty sure you can mix every other color they offer. It's 24 Pure Pigments plus white and black, so they don't count the white and the black in their, their count in their big tubes. Um, so that would be my recommendation if you're looking for one of them. I really like them. They had a reputation a few years ago um, of fading. Of, I think they've really fixed a lot of their issues that they had because um, they were using some dodgy pigments before. And um, all the pigments that I got in the set, that, the 24 pure pigments that I got were tried and true, um, you know, upstanding pigments. So uh, I wouldn't have any qualms. Now, they're a lot cheaper than Daniel Smith. You know, well, some places they are and some places they're not. So you do have to, you know, keep your eyes open. But uh, I, as far as the same quality, I don't know. Daniel Smith um, has always been known as being kind of a luxury quality. They they are higher in price, and their quality is really good. Um, are they worth the additional cost versus the Mission Gold? I don't know about that. I mean, I I know I'm getting a good paint, but um, but they're also very expensive, and they obviously pay their marketers a lot of money. If you ever read the descriptions, I mean, it's like. It's like you're looking at a personal ad, you know, it's like this, this romantic pigment is a mixture of this and that. And it's, you know, it's a, it's all, you know, wine and dine and romance and their descriptions. So, I mean, I kind of have to take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. And the last part of uh, her question, have you tried the silver black velvet brushes? Um, no, I haven't, but one of my students was using them. They seem to be uh, very similar to these. Um, again, they are more expensive. Um, very juicy. Uh, I think they're faux, like a faux squirrel brush as well. Silver has, a, I don't have any silver brushes, honestly, but they do have the reputa reputation of being a very fine watercolor brush, or I guess all the. Uh, Sophia and R, for painting landscapes, would you recommend the 18 set of Senlier, La Petite, Aquarelle, or Cotman? My budget is around $40. Um, uh, Senlier has a. Sennelier. Someday I'll get it pronounced right. It took me a while too. They have uh, the Petite uh, La Petite Aquarelle. They have a 24 set, and that is what I have. I would recommend that over the 12 set because uh, I feel there's more useful colors in that. And I think at Jerry's it's around $30, 30 in the $30 to $40 ballpark. Uh, so I would recommend that one over Cotman. I do think that it's a better um, quality paint if you can find it. It's not available everywhere. So Cotman is a, I, I like to recommend Cotman just because you can find it everywhere pretty much all over the world because Windsor Newton has such great distribution. But if you can get the Sennelier, um, I really, I would recommend that. And I honestly, working wise, and their payments are good. So I can't imagine they'd be that much, have a light fast problem. But, um, I find working wise because I compared them side by side this the student and the professional and they were almost indistinguishable. It almost makes me think that maybe they're just releasing these certain colors in a student line to kind of act as a feeder um, marketing program to get people to come over to the, you know, the artist line. Because I mean, I bought the olive green after trying it in the student line. Um, they're good paints. Uh, Jose Solano, is there any difference between gouache and watercolor paint? I've seen many artists use both mediums and they seem to be very similar. Gouache is simply opaque watercolor. It either uses pigments that are more opaque or it has opacifiers in them to, um, to make them more opaque. Paints that use opacifiers, um, and you'll see the term designer gouache, they are not as light fast because the pigments they have to add into them to make them more opaque disperse your finer pigments and it just makes them more susceptible to fading because the uh, extender, the opacifiers will fade. So that's just something to keep in mind. Gouache is generally used by designers um, because their work is going to be reproduced and it doesn't matter if it fades or not. That was the olive, the, the, all, the color I've been using is olive green and uh, ultramarine blue. So uh, if you're, pardon me, mixing that up, I just add the ultramarine blue to darken it a little bit. So if you feel like the olive green stands out enough on its own, you can just use that. If you need a little bit of dark, just add some ultra green blue to it. Uh, Mary shows, which brand has your favorite sap green? I can never find a green that looks natural. Um, I like uh, M. Graham sap green. And I like Sennelier's olive green, which looks almost identical to M. Graham sap green. Because usually I, I don't care for the olive green, but uh, 
but I do like the Sennelier. I couldn't believe it wasn't sap green when I tried it in the Le Petit Aquarel set. Okay, now I'm going to grab some Burnt Sienna. I'm going to see how that looks on its own. I might add a little bit of that bright red to it because I see just kind of this little, um, it looks like a dried fir tree, but I think it helps make that green set out. So I'm going to go ahead and dab some of that in there because it's in the picture, but it also really helps some of these other things stand out. Just dab a little bit in there. And a little bit of the olive green. And I'm just dabbing. It's not really a lot of uh, technique there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and grab some more of that burnt sienna and add some little branches into this little bush here. And I think I'll also kind of grab a little uh, Naples yellow or you can use yellow ochre, add it with a sap green. And I'm going to kind of dry brush in here a little bit, give a little texture, maybe also give like a little like a worn area of grass, like maybe people have a path, made a path to the lighthouse by wearing down the grass. I actually sketched a path in on my... Oh, do we have technical problems? Nope. I just oh. have a question. I thought you were, I didn't know you were still talking. Okay. Yeah, I'm just dry brushing a little path in here. What was the question? Uh, Lauren Rodriguez, have you ever tried tinted watercolor paper? Do you have suggestions for what type of painting would work nicely on this type of paper or on that type of paper? Uh, I have not. I, I generally use natural white paper. I have used a bright white. That's nice too. Um, but I always, I'm a little leery of the bright white because I don't know what they've used to brighten it just in case they've used like a bleach or something that might make the paper corrode um in the future but no I haven't but you know the spin doctor uh on YouTube did a little demonstration where he did like nine little sketches watercolor sketches on like nine different shades of tinted watercolor paper just so you could see the different effects um so I would recommend that video uh, maybe if someone uh, I'll try to remember to link it up but if anybody else um wants to link it in the comments i will approve the comments sometimes if there's a link it goes to spam but i can approve that i know he did that video it was probably like a year or more ago uh, and that would be a good um, reference for you i haven't seen rich around much in the chat i think he's he's just had a move so oh yeah that'll do it yeah all right now i kind of want to do something to the light there obviously it wouldn't really be glowing in the day um, but I think I might put just a little smidgen of lemon yellow, just kind of diluted down in there to see what that looks like. I can blot it off if I don't like it. I kind of like it actually. Maybe add a little of my mixed gray color up to the top of it to tone it down a little bit. Uh, Amanda Dalton, what makes the Isabel brushes so good and expensive? Do you know what the Isabel it's still, brushes are? It'll be, it'll be brushes. It's um, be it was typed as Isabel. Yeah, probably spell check. You know, okay. the spell check one in there. I don't have any, but I think it's probably because they're like um, the fur that they're using is probably a high quality animal fur. And th that is expensive. I mean, the trappers get paid a lot and, and uh, farmers that deal in fur get paid a lot of money for their, you know, for their work. And uh, that would that would drive the price up. Just like a fine fur coat costs a lot of money. And are they comparable to an Escoda? They're both. I ha I don't have either animal? of those. Yeah, I don't have either of those. Yeah, Lindsay um, doesn't buy brushes of with real animal hair in them. She only gets the faux. Yeah, sometimes it, they come in kits and stuff. Um, and I do have some because they've come in kits. But, yeah, I generally don't get them on purpose for that reason. I'm going to mix up a little more gray. I'm going to put some just some indications of shingles in here. Um, I honestly do most of my painting with these mimics. I just, you just can't beat the price and the performance of them. And, you know, I'm not going to spend $300 on a brush that, you know, I might, you know, drop out of a kayak. So, and, you know, I don't really want to encourage the fur trade.
And I'm just putting in, you know, just put in a little hint of hint here and there of a brick or a shadow. Don't don't try to paint every little thing because then it starts to look flat and fake. Uh, Camila Estrada, which watercolor paper would you consider buying? The brand I have absorbs water quickly. Um, there's a couple brands, that, and I just kind of look around and see when the deals are. Um, I really like Arches. I use that mostly. But um, there's also a paper called the Langton Prestige, and Jerry's had it on super sale, 10 huge sheets for, I think it was like 30 two dollars it might be a little more now but like this is an eighth of a sheet so you get eight paintings out of one sheet um if you were doing this size i really like that as much as arches and i just i, I tried it because it was on sale and i knew it was a decent company so i thought i'd give it a go um and so those two for my fine watercolor paintings but i also like strathmore wind power for like practice work and um you know, stuff that I'm not maybe going to spend a long time on. That's that's a really good paper, and that's fairly new. It's recycled even, so um, so even better, you know, if you're um, conscious about that sort of thing. it's uh, Sometimes recycled stuff is kind of junky and doesn't work, perform very well, but that happens to perform really well. And it has a good amount of sizing, and I think that's probably because it's recycled. It has, like, sizing from the paper they recycled, and then it's got the sizing they added to it, so... Uh, Carrie Cuddlepuss, how do you decide what five to six colors to use in each painting? I recently got the Daniel Smith 235 dot sheet and I'm feeling overwhelmed by choices. Yeah. Um, well, I look at what I'm trying to paint and what's going to, what I'll be able to mix my colors the best from. So for when I was using this, um, and this is, I think I can take my tape off. It's pretty much done, but I'll keep on chatting while I'm doing that. Um, I, I look at the colors and say, okay, what are what colors are going to give me the best results here and going to make my mixing the easiest? And I know, like, the sky definitely has that ultramarine blue in it. And I know ultramarine blue and burnt sienna are going to give me those beautiful stony colors. And I know yellow ochre is going to give me the warmer stony colors, and I can use it to deaden uh, some of the other colors if I need to. And um, I know I need a bright, warm red. So, you know, I chose a color that was pretty close to that already. So I look for clean colors that are versatile that I can mix well from, and then I also look for specific colors that are local to the scene that I'm painting. Um, and you know, the and when in doubt, choose something like you know your split primary color palette. Like if you look at look for the Daniel Smith Essential Palette, um, Essential Color Set. It's got six colors. It's got a warm and cool version of red, yellow, and blue, and that is an excellent place to start because honestly, you could mix pretty much any color you wanted from those, um, but some of it's going to take some work, and if but it's going to be a great set to start with. But then there's other colors that are very convenient to have, like your sap green and your burnt sienna, um, because they make mixing so easy, and it makes it so easy to get kind of some of the textures and stuff that you want. So, um, so that's where I would start off for basic supplies. But if you've got a, a set with several colors, like if I'm going to paint a floral, I'm probably not going to use that red that I used in this painting because I want a fresher, cleaner, cooler color. So I would go with a carmine or a quinacridone red. Um, and I might go with a phthalo blue instead of an ultramarine because that's just a more transparent, clear color. So if I'm, but if I, when I was painting um, in the Bahamas, I used that blue a lot because that was just naturally the local color of the water. And it just made my mixing a lot easier to use that blue as, a, as opposed to a phthalo blue or an ultramarine. So you look at your environment of what you're trying to paint and then, um, you know, look at what's going to give you the greatest versatility of mixes. Mm -hmm. we have any other questions? Oh, yeah. I've got to get back up to where I was. Da, da, da. Uh, Mary shows, have you ever used gold leaf on a watercolor painting after it's dry? Oh, let me think. Um, I've used uh, liquid uh, gold paint before to do some calligraphy on a painting afterwards. And I've used some gold leaf and mixed media work that included watercolor, but I don't think I've used it just on a straight watercolor. Uh, Dominique Designs, do you ever find the tape peeling off thin bits of paper when you peel it off? Sometimes on like a wood pulp paper, um, and when I peel the tape off, I make sure to like bend it down on itself so that it just redo and I and I so I pull the tape back and bend it and just pull it straight out like that so it seems to release the pressure. If I if you yank it straight up. You're, I don't know if you're pulling it off too fast or what, but that will tend to make it rip. And make sure your, pa your paper is completely dry before you attempt to remove the, um, the tape so that it doesn't tear. Wet paper is less robust and will be more fragile and want to 
want to rip on you. And then we're all caught up. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in today. And we'll see you in two weeks for the next live stream. There will be pre-recorded tutorials uh, until then. I want to thank Jerry's Autorama for sponsoring this video. And you can find all the supplies I used linked up in the video description, as well as a coupon code uh, for, I think it's 20 or 25% off and free shipping. So, mm. yeah. So some things are on sale. There's manufacturer's restrictions. And so the uh, the... The 25% off might not be on every product. You can look for the green coupon icon. Um, and I think it's over $49. You get free shipping. So, and that that it doesn't matter what you, you what you buy to get up to that $49. It doesn't have to be a coupon eligible thing for you to get the free shipping, I believe. So, so there's that. I hope you enjoyed it. Please give me a thumbs up before you go if you liked it and let your friends know about it. That really helps my channel and uh, helps me be able to keep bringing you these free live streams every week. Thank you, Sarah, for moderating, and thanks thanks to all the other moderators. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Till then, happy crafting.